I recently caught up with Dr. Ellen Damshin of University of Wisconsin-Madison, who has a paper in Journal of Ecology asking how plants on special soils called serpentine will respond to climate change. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? My name is Ellen Damshin, and I'm an assistant professor at UW-Madison in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm a plant community ecologist. I'm really interested in global change, especially uh, how climate change and habitat fragmentation are affecting plant diversity. What problem in ecology was your uh, study trying to solve, or, or what motivated your study? Yeah, my collaborators and I have on this paper have been really interested in special soil communities, particularly serpentine soils, for a long time. And um, these communities can be incredibly diverse and have a lot of endemic species that are only found in local environments. And so we were really interested to think about and ask how climate change might affect those special communities with really high diversity um, in comparison to a, quote, normal soil uh, community and if those changes are going to be larger, the same, or not as severe in special soil communities. So can you, can you for people that aren't familiar with serpentine uh, soils, what, can you briefly explain what those are? So serpentine soil is a really unusual soil type, but it's found across the globe. Um, it's typically found in places where there's been some sort of geologic uplift. Um, it's harsh for a number of reasons for plants. Uh, it's rocky, so it's very water limited. Um, it's also got a very strange calcium to magnesium ratio, so that affects cation um, availability and nutrient uptake. It can be low in phosphorus um, and potassium, among other macronutrients. And then sometimes there's heavy metals like nickel that are associated with serpentine soils. So for all those reasons, it can be sort of a nasty place for plants to live. Um, and plants that do live there have to acquire special adaptations to persist. In brief, what was your main finding or findings, if you could, if you could narrow it down to one or two bullet points? So um, we had two main findings from this study, and we had two separate components that we included in this paper. So the first was a modeling component. And here what we did was we used something called Maxent modeling or maximum entropy modeling, which is just trying to describe where a species exists right now. So you go out, you find where the species is, and then you look at where, what types of, of, of climate um, does that species, is that species found in. So precipitation, elevation, other climatic factors. And then you can describe the full range of where that species is likely to persist um, based on those locations. And then for climate change, you can then take climate projection models and ask, what is the future climate going to look like? And then in that new world, then you can ask, where is the species based on its present um, conditions, where is that likely to be found in the future? Um, so one interesting thing is that if you think about an, a species on a quote normal soil, um, let's say the species can be found in this circular area here, and this is today's distribution, if you project the climate into the future and let's say it moves like this, that species could be found anywhere in that circle if it's a normal soil species. But for serpentine species in the present day, let's say, it's only found in one tiny little place within this full climatic distribution. And so if you move the climate to a future distribution, that serpentine patch of soil is not going to move with the climate. And so because of that, we thought that the serpentine species would be more at risk than a normal soil species. But surprisingly, what we found was that that wasn't true. That the same relative amount of serpentine habitat is found in the new distribution or the new climate space as in the current climate space, and that's in comparison to a normal soil species. Um, and so that, that's really surprising. Um, so, but the other thing that we found is that even though that's true, this, this, the soil substrate is still patchy. There's no getting around that. So even though there's the same relative amount, the species is going to have to move from one soil habitat patch to another in order to keep up with those climate shifts. So that's where the rubber really meets the road in this finding, which is that the um, minimum dispersal distances was on the order of 500 to 1,000 meters between uh, suitable habitat patches. And we know that plants are not likely to disperse that far uh, based on past plant dispersal studies, um, at least over relatively short time scales. So the likelihood of these species being able to keep up is pretty um, un unlikely. 
Um, the second big thing that we looked at was just looking at the available evidence for um, what do we know about how serpentine communities respond to climate perturbations or climate experiments relative to normal soil communities. And we did a massive literature search and we only found four studies. <laughs> So uh, result number one is that we definitely need more studies to examine this question because we're just sort of on the tip of the iceberg for trying to, to understand what responses we're going to see. Three of the four studies found that serpentine communities showed less change to climate uh, manipulations um, than normal soil communities, and one of them found the exact opposite. So one of the things that we wrestled with was why do three studies show one thing but one study shows another? Um, and so I think future studies are really going to have to fill in those holes. Right. Uh, okay, so, so you suggested that uh, serpentine endemics won't lose suitable habitat um, with climate change, but that they're unlikely to disperse between habitat patches. So, so, so it seems like that's good and bad for serpentine species. Um, what is the sort of overall message then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's better than we um, potentially hoped or, or surmised could happen. Um, and so, um, not that we hoped. It, it, it's better than we guessed it could be. Um, so at least there is suitable habitat in the future range. So that's much better than not having suitable habitat at all. But given that these are patchily distributed species, um, climate change is likely to happen at a rate that's much faster than any past change that we've seen in, in climates historically. And so um, these species just may not be evolutionarily predisposed to be able to keep up with the rapid pace of climate change. Um, so I think what that calls um, for is additional studies to evaluate things like managed relocation, which is a conservation technique where you physically move um, a species from one location to another um, and help it disperse essentially. And there's a lot of trade-offs with that kind of approach. Um, in this case, because we're talking about um, typically more rare or endemic species that are probably less likely to become invasive or cause problems in its future range, it seems like a, in a, an approach that's worth considering and conducting some studies to see if it's feasible. Right, right. Um, so in what cases would you expect uh, climate change to have a large impact on uh, impact on species that are that are uh, live in patchy habitats. Yeah, I think um, there's a few things that could uh, sort of predispose species to have a um, higher risk. Um, one of them is if the distance between those isolated patches is really great. So the farther apart those patches are, um, the more likely it is that you're going to have uh, negative consequences. The second is the characteristics of the species themselves. So if the species themselves are not very good dispersers, if they only go a small distance, um, or if they're specialists and require, let's say, a specific bird species that's also um, facing trouble with climate change, then those might be cases where um, we have um, more risk that's expected. Um, and then also, in our case, we had this a very surprising match between the future distribution of the, the, the climate space and also the serpentine soil. But um, for other patchy habitats, that might not be the case. You may have a future climate that's just fine, but not find the patchy, patchily distributed habitat, um, if it's another soil type, for example, in that new space. How general do you think uh, the results from this uh this study are? Do they generalize to other special soil types? Um, for, it sounds like from your literature research uh, study that that's, we just probably don't know because there hasn't been enough um, studies. Um, so like in addition to that, in what cases would you um, expect the same or, or different patterns? Yeah, so I think um, that the general principles likely apply, but again, because we only have a handful of studies that have examined this, I think the word is still really out until we can gather more evidence. Thus far, I think that the bulk of the evidence is showing that serpentine and other special soil communities like the limestone grassland example are showing less change to climate perturbation than um, than the normal soil communities. But again, we have these atypical responses that we need to examine further um, I think that some things to consider, so 
things, communities that might have similar results would be those that are similar to serpentine. So they're going to be spatially out isolated outcrops. Um, and the, the, the distribution of the spatial outcrops also might be in a geographically, um, to topographically complex region where you have um, the ability to have multiple future climate types um, and, and not just a, a single change that where, where you, you don't have, um, I'm not saying this very well here. So the, where the geographic um, distribution of the soils also can coincides with topographically complex regions would be where you'd find a similar kind of result. And um, also that they're similarly limited by water, nutrient availability, and also potentially excessive cations and um, heavy metals. Now other special soils are going to have different kinds of factors. Some of them are only limited by nutrient availability. Some of them are mainly limited by water availability. They're just a rocky habitat type like shale or sandstone. Um, some of them also have other unique factors. So gypsum forms a very unique soil crust on the top of the soil surface that may play a really different and important role in um, determining how plants respond under climate change. So what do you think the consequences are uh, for the field um, from your study? I think the big consequence is that, uh, I hope, that it points out that we need more work on this. And we tried in um, the paper to provide a roadmap for what needs to be done. And the number one recommendation is that studies on climate change that are interested in addressing how climate change affects these botanically rich areas include plots or study locations on both the special soil and a comparable, quote, normal soil, a typical soil for that region um, in the same study and in the same location. That will really provide a lot of clarity. So there are studies that have been done on one or um, one of the soil types, but not both together, and that's really the key component. Um, and another thing is that uh, we really think that using um, these characteristics or what we call functional traits of plants is really important. So um, we used things like that can get at this drought tolerance capability that I was talking about, things like specific leaf area, um, leaf nutrient content, uh, those kinds of characteristics, as well as dispersal modes uh, to be able to characterize communities as a whole when many times when you're looking at a community on a special soil versus a comparable normal soil, there are relatively few species in common between those two locations. So you need some sort of axis that places all those species, those different species, in the same playing field. And the way to do that is to use the characteristics of the species or these functional traits. Right. Um, so what do you think was the most challenging part of the study? Uh, um, I think there's a couple things that were uh, challenging. First of all, as I've already mentioned, there were very few papers that were out there. So just trying to find the evidence in the first place was, took an enormous amount of time. Um, and second, then reconciling these opposing results that we found and just trying to think through what might be the reasons for that. Um, and then I think just integrating both the um, modeling component along with the, the literature review and, and thinking about these different aspects of uh, special soil communities and how they might respond both in a spatial context and in a sort of non-spatial context um, to climate change.